What is up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of Beat the Maze. It's Ian B. And it's your girl, Jaysha. And we are back with another special, special guest. This week, we have the nail doctor, the one and only Brian <laughs> Baker. Brian, Hi, how, you how you doing today? I'm good. How are you guys? Pretty good. Pretty good. good. So we always like to do to start off our episodes. It's just a check in with how our weeks are going and how the week's been. So starting with you, Ian, how's your week been going? My week is going. It's going. It's it's interesting. Um, I think I've shared on here a little bit, but I lost my mom about six months ago. So today oh. is her six month anniversary. Um, so it's it's an interesting time, but we are going. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm very, very happy to still be able to kind of just get my week going. And you you have to have some some downtimes to appreciate the ups, I truly believe. So just taking it all in stride and I'm continuing to move forward and, and be great every day. Jay, how you doing? That's real. Um, I've been pretty good. This week has been very um impactful, packed it packed it that's the really good it's been very packed with like a lot of things um juggling a lot jack of all trades but I've been really good and Ryan how are you well first of all I'm so sorry about your mom I'm sorry to hear that um sending you a lot of love and virtual hugs and all that good stuff um but my week has been it's been good I'm always busy I work seven days a week so it's just I'm busy <laughs> per the usual but that's okay. I like being busy. I like moving. That's good. That's good. Um, so for the people who might not be familiar with, do you mind just introducing yourself, telling people who you are a little bit and how you got into being coined the the nail doctor? <laughs> so my name is Ryan. My name is Ryan. Um, I'm 23. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Um, but I've lived in Charlotte since 2008. Um, I started doing nails when I was 16, when I was in high school, and I was actually coined as the nail doctor, I want to say 2018. Um, I was always, I was working for somebody else at the time, and maybe it was 2017, 2017 or 2018, because I know I was either 18 or 19, but um, I was working for somebody else at the time, and I was always kind of getting like the back end of clients. That's what happens when you work under someone who's already kind of well-established. You always get the leftovers, that's just how it works. And I was always like fixing up these crazy nail jobs. And somebody was like, it's like you're a doctor, like a nail doctor. And I was like, yeah, the nail doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just kind of what it's been ever since. That's hard. So Thank how, you. how did that go with getting to where you are now? So you said you, you were in high school, you went to UNCG mm-hmm. and it was like during this time period where you transitioned from being full-time into school to opening a salon and taking nails full-time. How was that? So, okay. So I graduated high school six months early and my parents were basically just like, okay, like, what are you going to do? And I was like, I don't know. And I was like, I want to take a gap year, like Malia Obama. And my mom was like, no. So, <laughs> <laughs> so no gap year. And she was like, no, for real, babe, like you got to figure it out. And so I ended up saying like, okay, I wanna go to nail school. And my dad paid for me to go to nail school and it was only a month and a half, so I did it in the summer. And I was, I was 18. Yeah, I was 18 when I went to nail school, but I had already been like doing nails for a couple of years now. And I went to nail school. And then after that, that winter, I enrolled in UNCG and I started doing nails on campus. There was a salon on campus that I worked out of and I only did that for six months. Um, I hated Greensboro. And so I was like, I'm, I'm going to go back to Charlotte. There was actually a period of time where um, I was splitting my time. So I did like Thursday, Thursday through Sunday in Charlotte. And then Sunday through like Thursday afternoon in uh, Greensboro. Oh, wow. So I was, I was splitting my weeks. It was a lot of back and forth. And I was taking clients in both places. Like as soon as I got to Charlotte, I was going to the salon. I worked out here. And then when I got back to Greensboro, I ended up just working out of my apartment. And then eventually that got old. So in December of 2018, I got a salon suite here in Charlotte. And so, yeah, I was 19 when I did that. And I remember telling my mom, like on the first day that I signed my lease, I was like, 
I'm not gonna renew my lease. Like I'm gonna get a salon. And she was like, Ryan, you literally just signed your lease. Like relax one day at a time, please. And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. So six months in, I broke my lease and I got my salon. Um, I did not leave my suite until two months later because I had two months worth of renovations to do and my landlord did not give me any free rent, which is what most commercial spaces do when you're trying to do your upfitting. He did not do that. So I had to get the ball rolling right away. And for two months, every single day, like 14 hour days, I was working at my suite all day. And then after I was done there, I would come here and like check on things, the progress of the build out and all that stuff. And I ended up having to pay for everything cash because I was 19. Like there was nobody who was going to give me a loan as a 19 year old. So, (laughs) um, yeah. So that's how I ended up with a salon and I've just been going ever since. Actually, I signed a lease for three years and I marked my third year this August, August 26th. That's so hard. I'm really excited. That's hard. That is super <laughs> duper hard. Congratulations. Thank and you. So I know one of the things that you mentioned was your dad paid for your nail school, but before mm-hmm. that you were doing nails for up to two years you said about mm-hmm. that so how how did that conversation go like was it was he kind of like you know parent you know parents have their like we still want you to do our plan but yeah it's all like you were taking it seriously how, how was that conversation so my dad has always been like really cool in a way of like he wants his kids to do whatever makes us happy And my mom is the traditional one. My mom is very much like, she's a first gen college grad. So she's like, you know, you go to college and that's the plan. And the plan was for me to go to college. And I think like a week before I left, my mom was like, you know, like, if you're not really happy, you don't want to do this. You don't have to. And I was like, okay. (laughs) 18 years beating into my brain that I have to go to college. What do you mean? I don't have to do this if I don't want to. So I was still... I did not drop out of school until six months into opening my salon. And that was just, I was just incredibly overwhelmed. I had a staff of eight and I was a full-time student. I just literally could not do it anymore. But when I told my dad I wanted to go to nail school, he was supportive, but he was very much, if you are not going to take this serious, I'm not paying for it. I want to see a return on my investment. My dad was like, you are not to miss one day of school. Like, no, no, like just no flim flam, like for, for lack of a better word. He was like, this is an investment. I want to see a return on my investment. You go to school, you do your work, you show up. If I'm putting my money into it, it better be worthwhile. And so mm. I remember you can only miss two days because school's a month and a half. I missed one day and my dad cussed me out. Like it was bad. I got in so much trouble. Um, and it wasn't even my fault that I missed school, but you know, so so I took it very serious after I missed that one day um, and yeah but it was funny when I opened my salon I was like is this a good enough return on your investment did, did I pay it back <laughs> you had that dad smile like hmm mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> so what is that like running the salon having a staff yeah. having to not only like run your salon and the operations with the staff and then get customers and make sure they're happy. It's like a lot of things that go into that. It's a lot. I wear a lot of hats. Um, it's fun because I, I, you know, I started when I was 19, I became a business owner at 19. And so I have spent the last four years growing into adulthood and womanhood and then also growing and learning how to be a business owner because it's not something that's innate um a lot of people have innate hustle a lot of people have innate drive but business and entrepreneurship are not innate really like I, I don't care who says it like hustle is in you drive is in you consistency is in you but running a business like that's not something that people just wake up and they're like I'm perfect at it I know how to do it yeah. and There's so many twists and turns. There's so many nuances, especially when you're dealing with service-based businesses, you're dealing with people and people are nuanced. People have their ways about them and having to learn that just because you like to be dealt with a certain kind of way or just because you're used to things a certain way doesn't mean that's how other people receive them. One of the 
the first, I think the first lesson I learned in my first year of business was that treating people they, the way they wanted to be treated is not applicable in business hmm. because I know how I like to be treated. I know how I like to work. I know how I like to be spoken to. That does not work for everybody, especially when you're dealing with staff. You have to figure out what works for them. How do they communicate? How do they receive information? How do they receive criticism and feedback? Because just because it works for you does not mean it's going to work for them. And if you just use your blanket methods, you're going to miss the mark with a lot of people. And so it's learning how to be fluid and adaptable. And, and like I said, as a 19 year old, like I think teenagers and young adults, people in our twenties were just selfish anyways. Like that's just, yeah. and it's not time to be selfish. But as a business owner, it's not a good time to be selfish, especially in your developing stages, because you really do depend on a strong team and a good foundation and the help of others in your community. And so to be selfish is to shoot yourself in the foot, for lack of a better phrase. And it's just, it's been a, a really big learning experience for me. And every day is a learning experience. And I think what's kind of kept me afloat and allowed me to continue to move through is just kind of being okay with knowing that I don't know everything and allowing other people to guide me and teach me. So, yeah. <laughs> you for being able to recognize that too, yeah. that like you can be selfish with this, that you do need a team to help you because so many business owners, they begin a business thinking it's me, myself, and I. Like, I'm, I'm CEO, yeah, I'm boss, yeah. whatever, whoever. And it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. but- there's also other people that help make this run too. Yeah. So yeah. how did it go with like you, you so you have the salon, you open it. Did you already have like a large clientele coming from when you were doing nails or from when your other oh, um, nail techs in the yeah. salon came? Yes. I was already well established within the city with clientele. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, <laughs> I know one thing that you mentioned, we talked about, um, a little earlier was you had to shut down at one point through COVID. So yeah. how were you already in your suite at that point? Were you- I was in my salon. I had opened my salon six so months prior to having a show. Walk us through that. Like, what was that like? Especially because I don't know how it was in Charlotte, but here in Atlanta, they was like, oh, wash your hands, boom, bang. And we're going to be back in two, three weeks. And we still are in COVID so many yeah. years later so so governor roy cooper i like that man shout out to him he, <laughs> he was very he took his time he took his time putting us into a lockdown but he was i mean off the bat it was a two month lockdown like off rip <laughs> and so um kai the, the now being like two years removed from it it was really traumatizing um i had just opened this fresh business. Six months is nothing. Six months flies. I just opened this fresh, fresh, fresh business. And um, I got the call about shutting down less than 48 hours beforehand. We were supposed to shut down March March 25th at 5 p.m. I got the email, not even the phone call, the email March 23rd, like late in the day. It was almost March 24th. And I went home and I cried and cried and cried and cried. And I don't cry. I very rarely cry. Like tears in me, that's not my thing. So I went home and I sobbed and I was just like, what in the world am I going to do? Like, I just opened this business. I have all these people. How am I supposed to pay them? Because, you know, when you're, when you're in a service-based business like this, the money that you make is dependent on your working schedule how am I going to pay eight people and make sure they're okay? And everybody else is Hmm. an adult. Like when I opened my salon, I was 19, 20. Everybody else was like 25, 30. So I'm like, how am I going to make sure these grown people stay afloat? Like for however long we're supposed to be locked down. And it was just really scary. I felt a lot of pressure. And then aside from that, I didn't know if I was going to be coming back to a business because aside from trying to make sure that people were good, um, how am I going to run a business that's not in operation for two months? Like my landlord is horrible. I have no problem saying that. Um, he is, he's awful. When did this happen? Like he, we all had a meeting, all the tenants and we were like, you know, are you going to assist us? And he was like, no, there's nothing I can do. 
Um, I, so I paid all of my bills in full while we were in quarantine, only to come back and find out I was the only one doing so. Everybody else told them, like, no, we're not paying it. And so I, you know, I didn't know any better. I didn't know that I could challenge that. You know, I didn't want to get evicted. So <laughs> I was paying my bills and it was stressful. And the stress of having to come in here and pack up a business that I had just put together, I had to shut it down, like clean it up and shut it down and, and walk out of here and not know when I was going to walk back in. That was a lot. It was a, it was a big, big, big weight on my shoulders. But I took it like a champ. I'm not gonna lie. When that March 23rd, I went home and I cried and I said, "Okay, all right, God, you gonna figure it out. I, I I trust you're gonna do that." And what I ended up doing is I was like, "Okay, guys, gathered up my team. I was like, we're gonna go out with a bang." And I did a nailathon because we had to be closed March 25th at five. So I think I came in March 24th at 4 a.m. and then worked until March 25th at five. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow okay <laughs> so i'm assuming that that turned out great <laughs> mm-hmm. it did it did it helped a lot and, wow that really wow yeah and that's why i say like hustle hustle can be in you knowing how to run a business is not that just that's something you learn along the way but if there's anybody who will come down here and bust down 24 hours and not that night, I'll do it. You the nail doctor, show. Okay. <laughs> I just feel like it's part of the job. So, I'm sorry, I'm still just like taking that in. But yeah. I was I was in Charlotte when, when COVID happened and I saw all that went on and it, it was like immediately like shut down like he was here and I was telling him like you need to be inside we're shut down yeah. and he's like everyone's outside we're chilling we're going to the park today <laughs> so yeah, no, I, and I never shut down we going to the park no. today look I'd call my boss and be like I'm not feeling good <laughs> my friends be like y'all want to go on the hike sure come on wow uh-huh man but um yeah it really it truly was a scary time and I think as many business owners in that time can say the same like you, you don't really know where you're gonna get that next month from so I really applaud you for not only figuring out something to quickly like kind of go out with a bang but then also coming back from the pandemic because you now you have to get bring in this clientele and the same overall goal is still to attract consistent and more clientele what was yeah. that like coming back and were you able to bring all your staff back were they how did that work? No, I lost, I lost over half of my staff because COVID still affected people and their in their living situations and their financial situations. Um, I'm just now back to a place where I'm seeing myself booked the way I was pre-pandemic. Um, just now, two years later, two and a half years later, just now. Um, because you know, people it's still scary, like you have all these new variants coming out and people are like, I don't want to get sick. Yeah. yeah. And I don't blame them. I don't yeah. want to get sick. So it's, it's definitely, I've had to take a lot of pivots, a lot of turns, a lot of, a lot of curving curve balls and all that stuff. So yeah, it's been, it's been just <laughs> trying out the time. So tell back. us, oops, sorry. So tell us more about, like you said, pivots and turns. And I know like, you, you do, like you were doing um, the, you were selling press-ons, you were doing pedicure kits, you were hosting nail classes. You also were working with like major nail brands and doing that brand ambassadorship. Was that a part of that pivot or was that like, what was, what was your mindset going into these different things? I got to make some money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, because that, that, that is the mark of, of true entrepreneurship because you just don't know what's gonna happen ever. Like we're about to be in a recession if we're not already in one. I still have to pivot through that. You know, like, you know what I'm saying? Like I opened, I opened with no money. And then six months later, I'm shut down. And then three months later we come back, but I lost my half my staff and people aren't wanting to book for the last two years. And now that people are ready to book again, we're about to be in a recession again. Like, so, okay, these things keep happening. The world keeps turning. I have no control over that. How am I going to maintain a business? And so it's, there is nothing on my mind except for this is the career I chose. 
how am I going to be flexible enough and figure out how to maintain my income? That's all I got. <laughs> That's all. I got. No, it's it's all a part of your testimony, honestly. At the end of the day, it is absolutely. I w- I want to touch on a point that Jaja brought up and said you and I know you say it as well. You only use Premier nail products, and I know mm-hmm. that. You doing my little bit of research on you. You work with uh, Valentino Beauty Pure, and you talk a little bit about going with or meeting David, um, the owner of uh, Valentino, and kind of the pressures that he put on you. How do you think that impacted your journey, and how do you think his mentorship helped you be the entrepreneur that you are today? It helped tremendously. It helped tremendously. That's he's he's like an older brother to me now. I met him when I was 19. I was still in Greensboro full time. And I was just not bubbly, but just very straightforward. I've always been very straightforward. And so I met him at a nail class hosted by one of his other ambassadors. And I had like my nails done really intricately and I had all his products on my nails. And he went, a lot of girls were like going up and talking to him because he's a really big deal in the nail industry. He's a huge deal. So all the girls are going up, trying to talk to him, take his picture and everything. And me, I'm like, I'm too cool for that. So I just, I just kind of stood off to the side and I waited for him to approach me. And as soon as he approached me, I was like, hi, I'm Ryan Baker. I'm 19. I'm a marketing major and I want to work with you. And he was like, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> And he was like, well, take my number and like, we'll discuss business. And so I took his number. And when I got back to Greensboro, we were just texting back and forth. You know, I was just telling him what I do in school, how long I've been doing nails. I was asking him business questions and like, this is going on for hours. And then he just goes, okay, well, I'm about to go to bed. It was great chatting with you. Welcome to the team. And I was like, what? I was like, oh my God, I'm about to see how you know, like I was so excited. I can't believe how I did it. And but then that's when the real work started, the real mentorship. And he was like, yeah, he was like, you know, this is cool. You're good and everything. He was like, I'm not about to just hand this to you. And I was like, I didn't ask you to. And he was like, yeah, but I'm not. And I was like, okay. And and just in case you didn't know. <laughs> yeah, like, just in case you didn't know, this is not about to be easy. And, um, and he, oh my God, he used to bust my chops so bad. Like, I remember he was like, your work is good, but... I'm not going to post you until you get 5,000 followers. And so I did like a giveaway on my page and I hit 5,000 followers in two days. And he was like, you did that too fast. I'm not going to hit post you until you hit 10,000 followers. And I was like, oh my God, he hates me. Like, But a lot of, a lot of how I was talking about these curveballs and these pivots and entrepreneurship, I feel like in a way he absolutely prepared me for that. Even with my journey to becoming an educator with him, that took a long time and and we even I I get mad at him all the time because I'll tell him all these projects that I want to do and he'll be like oh yeah we'll do it we'll do it we'll do it and then something will happen and he'll be like well can't we can't do it now and to me I like I like to work alone for one so being a business owner has taught me the importance of teamwork I'm like no I want to do it right now and if you're not going to do it with me I'm gonna do it regardless and like having to really learn working with him and, and having to work on someone else's time has taught me the importance of timing and of patience and allowing things to come to fruition when they're supposed to and not when you think they should. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's the, he's, he's my big brother. Um, we, 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 we fight like cats and dogs, but we love each other even harder. And I really am appreciative for him because he was the first person that treated me like an adult in this industry. A lot of people were like, oh, you're just a baby. And he was like, all right, cool. You want to be grown and work? Come be grown and work. And he really, he, he never babied me, never. And I really am appreciative of that. And yeah, go ahead. Babe. No, you got it. Oh, I was going to ask, um, cause I noticed in the back that you have pamper lounge so how is using how has using um the the vp the vbp products plus the luxury um environment that you set how has that affected like the way that your clients see you because i know that's a really big part of being i think being a person especially being a a marketer but being a, a a successful business entrepreneur it's really like telling a story to yeah serving 
So with branding, branding my business at least, I like to create exclusivity for my clients. I want my clients to feel like I go to the nail doctor, you know, like you can't get in there, but I go there, you know, I want, because that does a lot of the legwork of marketing for me. If my clients, if I create an exclusive vibe for my clients and people are like, oh my gosh, where you go get your nails done? And they're like, oh girl, I go to the nail doctor, but she's hard to get into. No people always want what they can't have. So now they want to see, oh my God, how can I get on her books? And so a big thing for me was creating exclusivity and luxury, but primarily for black women. Um, I feel like we are extreme we we not even extreme we are innovators the the blueprint for everything in the world but specifically the beauty industry and we are not heading a lot of the tables where these discussions are being had and these influences are being broadcasted on a larger platform and that's just kind of always been a problem to me so okay fine you have you have plenty of luxury nail salons around charlotte you have polish you have Anthony Vince and Cache and everything. But when you look at the clientele and you look at the people that are in there, it doesn't match. And so I really wanted something that served as both a safe space for Black women, but a luxurious space for us. Because I feel like we shouldn't have to compromise on what we have. Because a lot of times we're offered spaces, but it's not top notch. And so I wanted something that was for us, by us, but it was also the top of the top. And that was just really, really important for me. Um, I wanted women to be able to come in here and talk with women that look like them and have shared similar life experiences with them. And I want everybody to come in here and feel like it's fellowship going on. That was really important to me. I love seeing my clients meet each other or they end up having appointments on the same day. And they're like, oh my God, girl, I haven't seen you since our last appointment. Like what's been going on? How are your kids? How's your vacation? I love seeing that fellowship. I love feeling like I'm playing a part in creating invaluable relationships for other Black women and creating a community. So that's just really important for me. That's that's kind of my whole vibe. And I will say your salon definitely speaks for itself. I myself, when you, I, first of all, I love your work. And he was looking at your work and he was like, yo, she's dope. I I (laughs) love good nails. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm a fan. And I was, one thing I really appreciated, not only do you hold yourself of the highest of standards, but you also hold your clients of the highest standards. And so when I started really getting interested in like acrylics, I was like consistently on your page trying to like learn more because you would just educate and like yeah. learn the difference between like what's MMA and all those other things and like what's not good for your nails and stuff. And it was, it was helpful to say the least, because it's like, you know what, like, no one does teach you. They just kind of like, oh, go to the neighborhood shop. And it's like, yeah, yeah you go to the neighborhood shop. And then now I have a fungus growing on my nail. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really do appreciate that, that education perspective. So moving into a, like a marketing one, like you said, you were a marketing major. How has, you said, he told you, you need to get double the amount of followers. You need to really boost your, your presence on social media. How, how did you plan that out? Like, how did you go into that? Like, okay. I need to boost this, this, this audience. I need to get people to see me. But then also, again, you were starting young, you were 19. Well, you've been doing since 16, but you were 19. You're like, Mm -hmm. I need people to take me serious. I'm not Mm -hmm. just in my room doing different designs. I'm a business owner. I think the biggest thing was showcasing that seriousness. So like I said earlier, people would be willing to do the legwork for me. That's to me, like, that's the easiest way to market because when you see influencers like Jada and Ari and stuff, they're not famous because they post pictures. They're famous because they post pictures and then other people have now held them to this higher regard. Other people are promoting them and saying, oh my God, I want to look like her. I want to be like her. I want to shop where she shops. I want to eat where she eats. I want to hang out where she hangs out. They didn't do that. Other people did that for them. That, that is the first thing I recognize of kind of the influencer culture and marketing. And it's not you, it's convincing other people to do it for you. And that's, that's a really big part of branding and creating your brand. And so you create something that people want to be a part of, or that people want to emulate, or that people feel like they can relate to. 
and then allow them to spread the word. Word of word of mouth marketing is not dead. It's just translated over to social media. And so That's okay. that was just a really big, yeah, that was just a really big deal for me is like, okay, how do I create something that people want to be a part of? And so a big, a big, 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 big component for me, because it's not something that has really been heard of as far as nail techs go. And I'm not by any means, I'm not saying I'm the innovator, but if you could say one, one of one of the influences, sure, I'll take credit for that because I don't see it often. Um, a lot of nail techs, they hide behind their work. They don't showcase themselves. They don't show what they wear. They don't show their likes, their personality. And I came out the gate like, what's up y'all, I'm Ryan. Like, and yeah. I remember David, he was like, he would always teach classes and he would tell the girls, he was like, look at what she's doing. like people are booking with her and, and supporting her, not because of how awesome her work is, because if we're being honest over the years, my work has improved a lot, you know, and that's just natural as I've gone along. But it was because people were, I, I, as I was presenting myself, which it wasn't a false image, I was presenting myself, but they were like, I like her, like she, she reminds me of my girl. People always come in here, they're like, you always give me homegirl vibes. And so it's just creating an experience that people want to be a part of and allowing them to spread the word for you. That's all it is. And it's free. <laughs> people buy brands. They don't buy products. Mm -hmm. They buy brands. They buy, they, like you said, they buy into their lifestyle. They, I, I am definitely one of the people I'm like, I like this person. I respect her. I respect her work. I see her hustle. I'm going to buy something from it. And 10 times yep. out of 10, the quality matches her, like her as a person. So yep. definitely, I definitely agree with that. So I think, where do you see the nail doctor going? Where do you see the salon going? Are you kind of wanting to stay? Like you like being in the salon. I'm assuming you like doing nails yourself. Like you're, mm -hmm. you really enjoy that, or that creative outlet. Where do you see this? Yeah. Going? Um, so I have, without, without divulging too much of my plans, I really want to work on creating extensions of the nail doctors but different concepts for each extension. Um, so just having something that serves a different community with each new conception. So that's, that's kind of like my primary focus, but also um, with right now, like my, my present focus is education. I'm really big on education and teaching the next generation. I just had a class the other day and I had two, two girls in their thirties, but I had a 15 year old in there as well. And my thing is, okay, I started at 16. I want to start teaching girls at 10. Like, because to me, me feeling like I've made it and that I've been successful is conceiving a generation of nail techs that are doing more than I was at my age and doing better than I am. So that, that, that means the world to me now, because the thing is, we come here to set an example for people to surpass. So yeah, I just, yeah. <laughs> I wanna do some outreach too. Um, something that's kind of been a passion project on my heart for a while is getting into juvenile detention centers, women's facilities, women's correctional facilities, and teaching nail courses, teaching business because a nail license and even sponsoring them, a nail license is $20 a year. I would really love to get into these centers and work on and focus on rehabilitation rather than punishment, because this is a skill you can take with you anywhere. And if it costs $20 a year to maintain whatever, I'll do it. So, yeah. Talk, talk to us more about that. I'm actually really in interested in that. I've never heard of anyone. And, and I, I think, yeah, I'm not even going to say what I think. <laughs> I've never heard of anyone talk about <laughs> working with like different rehabilitation systems and yeah, doing that type providing of a skill that, like you said, once you have finished in this, this space, and you've moved to another space, you can take it with you to keep you from yeah. that space going back. Yeah, space. absolutely. So, you know, I, I, something, one of my really big passions in this life and something that I took very serious in school is um, racism, systemic racism and how a lot of things in America are a system that, that are inherently rooted in violence and racism. And when you look at one of those systems, it's the privatization of prison and the prison industrial complex and sometimes the pipeline from public schools to prison. Um, and that's something that's just always been really, really close to my heart because you see people who 
are being told that they're disadvantaged maybe because the color of their skin or their circumstances. And that's just not true. Like people are just not offered the same resources. We see so much talent that is untapped into in so many different neighborhoods and Mm -hmm. it either gets exploited or, or it's just looked over altogether. And these people become habits of their products of their environment. And I feel like if people just had access to resources and they knew that there were other options other than what's directly presented in front of them, it could really change the world and the statistics that we're provided with. And I also think just because you've gotten into a certain situation that shouldn't be the mark of your life, that shouldn't be the scarlet letter that you wear for the rest of your life. Um, So I'm really really big into something that American prisons fail a lot at is rehabilitation, it's a punishment. Even when you go in and look at and you see why do people keep going back to jail? It's easier to be in jail than to be outside. And then uh, how yeah. much money prison, private prisons especially make off of the prison industrial complex and the disparity of black people being incarcerated and then this labor that they're getting off of them. It's, it's modern day slavery. And I want people to feel like women or men, but you know, my, my primary focus is women that just because somebody told you this is what your reality is and this is what your situation is going to be forever it doesn't have to be there are several options and there are people out here willing to provide you with the resources and i think young girls too i want to get to them before it gets too far you you have direction you can be self-sustainable and you can be self-sufficient and even older women i i even something that kind of bothers me a lot is thinking about like women in shelters and women in um kind of dire situations and I always feel like dang they probably feel like like this is it they have to be here and like they can't get a regular a regular job because of their circumstances and this is literally something it costs twenty dollars to maintain like even nail school nail school I think cost my dad like twenty five hundred dollars so okay I'm I, I feel like it's nothing that to we could find people to sponsor these women and, and make sure they really, yeah, you know, if I have, if I have connects with a major company, like, and different power players within my city, going and sponsoring, let's say we sponsor five women a year, that's, that would be a really big deal to me. Um, and just kind of, kind of helping people get, get some new footing, get a, get a new path. A lot of women, I even like, when I used to watch Orange is the New Black and I was like, there's salons in prison? And like seeing the way they get crafty and everything and like it's bred out of necessity. But then you, when you look at it, you're like, damn, like these people are geniuses. They just don't have the resources. And if I'm in a position to provide the resources, okay, whatever, I'll do. Like it's, it's not that big of a deal to me. It's common sense. If you're in a position to help others, you should. It's just the natural next step. And that's, that's who I've decided I want to help. Yeah, I I appreciate that for a number of reasons. I used to work with a boys juvenile detention, um, juvenile justice center, and the program was to divert the youth so that they didn't go to jail. So instead of going to jail, they did this program. But Mm -hmm. one of the things I noticed even in there was they're like, oh, you're, you're in here. Like, you should just be grateful. You should just be grateful that you're not in jail. You should just be grateful that you're not dead. But it's like, yo, these boys need love these boys need counseling these boys need counseling these boys need there was a student we had he was really in the fashion he great love him love him um he was really in the fashion and we had somebody come in one time and ended up working with the guy that came in the guest and the boy got a ten thousand dollar check to pursue his fashion business whole life change and i think like people don't talk about that people just oh they messed up they sold this they did that it's like yeah they did but it's also like there was so many so many people are not willing to also give them guidance and i uh, you know i feel the way i feel about people in correctional facilities is that when you look at them and you really start talking to people because a lot of times we don't talk to people we don't listen to people When you listen to other people's stories, you kind of realize that we're all a couple of bad decisions away from being in the same predicament. Like, (laughs) it's a lot closer to home than we choose to acknowledge. And so for me, it's just about empathy and human connection. I feel like that's something we've really lost as just people 
is we're so individualistic and we don't know our neighbors and we don't know who we're talking to. And it's just like, even when I go home, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Like I watch my dad talk to everybody. Like he knows his mailman, he knows his UPS guy, he knows the people at the grocery store. Like yeah. that is something, that community is something that is really missing. And I think it's community is something that makes a difference. I know it's made a difference in my life for sure. I, I've, I'd be nothing without the community that I was born into and have inherited along the way so I wholeheartedly agree I'd say consistently and we converse about it consistently people were we were not made to be alone on this earth as much as people may believe it as much as people believe like this whole I don't need you it's all about me thing like we weren't made to be like that we were made to live in community every yeah. mammal species on this planet lives in community mm-hmm that's what yep. we do. like that's where you thrive and I completely agree and I award like I applaud you for that goal and I really I I love that I am excited to watch you grow <laughs> everything oh, you yeah. said here I'm just blown Thank away you. like you as a person but then also I can tell <laughs> and we didn't really get into like kind of the drive behind it but I can tell you definitely have like a strong sense of spiritual self and a strong connection <laughs> to some, some motivation so yeah. like, I wish you nothing but the best in your business. I appreciate you so much for coming on to our podcast and sharing us a little bit about your story. Thank you guys for having me. Absolutely. Before we let you go, we like to do this thing called a bag drop. Some people do a mic drop. We like a bag drop. So if you had to leave somebody in the audience, there's an entrepreneur out there, I'm sure that's listening right now, and they're struggling, they're in the same place that you were at 16, at 19, and you have all your experience, what would you leave them with to move forward? Oh, gosh. No pressure. No, right, no pressure. What would you leave them with? An entrepreneur in my my position. You know, so it's something that I just kind of came up with. It was something that I was just able to put words to. Um, but it was, okay, God, show me, show me how good it can get. Like, and that's, that's kind of it. Like, I think a lot of times we're capable of so much more than we even envision for ourselves. And I think whomever your higher power is, okay, show me how good it can get. I give, I give it to you. Show me how good it can get. And that's kind of what's taken me through every stage of my life and entrepreneurship is I always kind of, I always have these breakdowns. I'll be like, all right, God, I don't really have a plan. So go ahead and show me what yours is. And I'll, I'll do the work. I'll do the work to get there. I'll, I, if it's not right, redirect me. But whatever, how good you feel like it can get, because clearly I can't envision what you envision as someone who's omnipotent and all that stuff, show me how good it can get. And I'll just do the legwork until I get there. I'll know when I get there, but just show me. And I've been getting shown for a little while now. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. Truly, truly. I agree. I pray every morning, every night for God to give me the ability to listen. Just to listen. Yep. Yeah. Listen is the biggest part of communication. So I love it. Absolutely. It's not speaking. I love it. So, Brian, where can the people find you if they want to continue following you and your journey or even book an appointment? Instagram. Instagram is the best place to follow me, find me, connect with me. Um, my username is Hapa Renee. A lot of people <laughs> mispronounce it. They say Harper, but it's H-A-P-A-R-E-N-E-E. Hapa Renee. For sure. And we'll link that in the sh- uh, along with the show notes in the bio of this episode, Jaysha. Uh-huh. Where can the people find you on the internet? You guys can find me on Instagram at Jaysha Robinson. And Ian, where can I find you? Y'all can find me, you already know, on Instagram and Twitter at EMB2 underscores and on TikTok, Ian.B3. And you also can find our podcast and listen to many more episodes with amazing business owners and entrepreneurs at Beat the Maze Podcast on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, any podcast streaming platform you can think of we're on there and we look forward to talking to you next awesome thanks guys for having me thank you